Thank you very much, uh, Charles. I think listening to Paul and Janine and the other sessions before lunch, you know, when we're sitting here at this conference, it's becoming more and more obvious that we do need revolutionary solutions. What we're hearing um, about at this event and elsewhere, you know, we're hearing about pockets of great progress in the private sector. We know now that the leading companies are striving to become more sustainable. They are striving uh, to decouple their business growth from increasing environmental impact. However, I think what we're also hearing at this conference is that the total business response is not yet equal to the, tackle, to, to the challenge of tackling climate change, resource scarcity, and the other global threats that we've sort of just touched on during this, this event. And of course, it doesn't just fall on business to resolve these big challenges. It is, as we've heard, uh, about system change with policymakers, businesses, NGOs, and so on. So last year, we know it was a record year for CO2 emissions, wasn't it? Um, we know that countries are missing their biodiversity targets. Uh, the slowdown of biodiversity loss is not yet happening. That's what we heard in Nagoya in Japan. We know that in recent decades, uh, natural capital has been depleted, and that capital is under further pressure from particularly now the emerging econo economies, but also, of course, the developed ones as well. We know that the sheer growth in demand for natural resources is outpacing any sorts of gains we are making in resource efficiency. Jeremy Oppenheim made that point. And the same goes around uh, carbon and energy. Aircraft, vehicles, dishwashers, they're all getting more energy efficient, um, but the sheer growth in numbers of those things being bought and used is outstripping any sort of progress we're making on energy efficiency. And so this, of course, is why we need revolutionary solutions. We need to change the game. We need disruption in the system. We need biomimicry, as Janine was saying. Um, we need all kinds of dramatic new ways of doing business. We need dramatic new business models. And this is something that WWF uh, spends a lot of time looking at. Uh, we are in our 50th year this year at WWS, our 50th anniversary, and as part of that, we are soon releasing another collection of 50 potential green game changers. So watch out for those. These are examples, case studies we've collected from around the world of companies doing really something quite different, some of which uh, we've heard today and are included in, in that batch of uh, green game changers. So this is, is all about sharing experiences of companies doing different things, and that's what um, this panel session is all about. We are about to hear from a number of panelists um, who are going to share their experiences around green innovation. And we've got a really good mix of sectors for you. We're looking at shipping, the automotive sector, footwear, and we've got a very good sort of fledgling, uh, disrupting online business uh, as, as well, a, se a social networking business. So um, that's what we're looking at. We're not so much looking at the system innovation that was discussed earlier. We're talking in this session about the go-first companies. Um, so before we go and talk to those panelists, um, our mix of industry experts, we're first going to hear from well-known uh, sustainability guru, well-known thought leader. Unfortunately, he's not here in person, um, but he has sent us a film clip. Um, so we're going now to cut to uh, a film clip from uh, John Elkington. Hello, I'm John Elkington. I'm Executive Chairman of Valence, and I think your theme uh, of this conference, which is Reaching for Zero, is wonderfully uh, timely, and what I'd like to say is why I think uh, that to be uh, the case. But a little bit of context first. Um, early last year, some of you, in fact most of you, may well have read the Accenture report uh, for the Global Compact uh, called A New Era of Sustainability. And if you've been involved in the sustainability uh, field for as long as I have, which is uh, now over 25 uh, years, some of the findings you would have found uh, encouraging, uh, possibly even delightful. So, for example, the fact that of 766 CEOs around the world, 
93% said that they were uh, convinced now that sustainability is important alongside climate change and all of these other things, that that, that, that was encouraging. 88% of them said that they felt that they now had to drive these new uh, requirements through their supply chain. Well, that was good uh, as well. But the shocker uh, for me was when 81% of those CEOs said that they felt that they had already embedded sustainability in their businesses. Now, I don't think those people were lying, but I do think that they are giving uh, rather plentiful evidence that they don't yet totally understand what sustainability uh, involves. And I think in all of this, we're at a, a really quite remarkable uh, uh, period. So 2012, next year, is uh, just chock-a-block with uh, milestone events. So we have 40 years on from limits to growth. We have 25 years on from the uh, Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future. We have uh, the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference, and that's just some of them. And I think what's really, really fascinating is the way in which what the Limits to Growth study predicted is now starting to happen. So you start to see, for example, uh, energy security, food security, water security, climate security, all of these different uh, uh, challenges starting to come together. And uh, it's very clear that now, unlike the early 1970s, when the Limits study came out, they're interlinked, very, very powerful. And I increasingly use a, an image of a, a Rubik Earth, a Rubik Cube uh, uh, with the colors of the Earth on it, just to say, you know, this is a very tricky puzzle uh, that collectively we're now going to have to uh, um, uh, tackle. And in some ways, I, I almost find myself going back to the point where Alexander the Great uh, was confronted with, uh, as you may recall, the Gordian Knot. And rather than trying to sort of untangle the wretched thing, he just pulled out his sword, we're told, and hacked. Uh, through it. He may simply have pulled it off the shaft of the cart on which it sat and got into the internal guts of the matter. But in any event, he, he was bold. And I think now the time has come uh, to be bold. So corporate social responsibility, wonderful. Corporate citizenship, fantastic. But we've really got to get now into the disruptive uh, change uh, agenda, the system change uh, agenda, uh, I believe. And for me, going back to that theme of reaching for zero, Zero is almost like uh, Alexander's sword. It is something that cuts right to the heart uh, uh, of an issue. And this has really been borne in on me as I've, uh, at the last nine, ten months, worked on uh, my new book, which is called The Zero Noughts. So basically refer uh, referencing back to the, the Argonauts, the astronauts, the cosmonauts, people who really pushed uh, the boundary of uh, human experience uh, and, and, and knowledge. And I've interviewed people around the world who are trying to drive their companies, their value chains, their industries uh, towards zero carbon, uh, zero toxics, uh, zero waste, and even in, in, in some cases towards um, uh, uh, social goals, zero pandemics uh, and zero poverty. And, and, and I'd just like to celebrate uh, the late, great uh, Ray Anderson, who with his Mission Zero at Interface was one of the most extraordinary and courageous uh, um, uh, and committed uh, innovators in this space. And when I talked to him shortly before he died, one of the things that he, he said that stuck in my mind was that zero uh, for Interface and for him was the most motivating single uh, approach that he had to come across in his entire uh, business career. If you look around the world, uh, you'll find that certain countries are well ahead on the zero front. So if you think about the total quality movement and Kaizen and zero defects and so on, no surprise to find Japan has gone down the zero uh, uh, pathway in relation to environment and waste as well. But let's be very, very careful because one of the Japanese companies, and there are over 2,000 now that have uh, zero-based targets publicly declared, one of the, the uh, uh, companies or, or business institutions there that in 2004 announced quite publicly uh, some zero waste targets was TEPCO, TEPCO Tokyo Electric Power Company. And then they gave us uh, Fukushima. And one of the phrases I find myself rather uncomfortably increasingly uh, 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 using, rather like greenwashing, is the concept of zero washing. That increasingly we run the risk that companies will use some limited zero based targets to mask other things that they're uh, doing or not doing uh, as well as they uh, might do. And we've seen a number of companies, including, for example, BMW, taken to task on the advertising around zero emissions vehicles. Well, these things in use are zero emissions, but if you take the, mm. the full uh, life cycle and the, 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 the electricity grid uh, and so on, they clearly are not. 
So just to draw this to a conclusion, where are we in all of this? I increasingly find myself thinking back to the late 1940s and early 1950s. At that time, uh, test pilots were increasingly slamming into something in the middle of the skies. They didn't know what it was, but they called it the sound barrier. And it, it, it seemed to be pretty vindictive. It shook a lot of these early planes apart, uh, killed many of their pilots. I think that is exactly where we are with what I'd like to call the sustainability barrier. In one way or another, around the world, in different sectors, different geographies, on different issues, we're slamming into the sustainability barrier. It's very difficult to get our brains around it at this time, and it looks impossible at the moment to get through it. We will get through it just as we got through the uh, sound uh, barrier. That's my message to the uh, B4E uh, event. Uh, I'm thrilled to hear that this will become uh, an annual event. I'm really sorry that I'm not going to be there. In fact, I'm going to be in southern Turkey, so it's a bit of a, 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 a balance. But I immensely look forward to hearing how the event has gone uh, and some of the conclusions uh, and, and recommendations that emerge uh, from it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and have a wonderful day. Uh, good. Uh, thank you, John Elfkinton. We'll have to report back to him. Um, can I ask Richard and Reiner to come to the stage, please? Uh, we have uh, John Elkington's talking about sort of pioneers of history, and hopefully we have two pioneers coming up to the stage uh, right now. And uh, a brief introduction, um, Richard Matteson, who sat down first, is the chief executive of TrueCost, and uh, Reiner Hengsman is the global director of Puma Safe Supply Chain. And uh, there's been quite a lot of press pickup uh, on this in the UK recently. Um, together, TrueCost and Puma have brought out um, quite a big sort of game changer, really. It's, the, it's one of the very few environmental pros, profit and loss um, statements that have been put out by any sort of global business. Um, Reiner, can you sort of tell us um, what, uh, very briefly, what does the profit and loss statement cover? And also, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about what made Puma take this step into releasing um, quite a sort of bold statement. Okay, <clears throat> okay before I do this, to be fair, uh, you mentioned Puma, Trucos, you forget, uh, uh, you forward price waters, Coopers. So actually we were three of us. Um, the idea of the profit and loss, and this actually matches quite, quite well, which was discussed here, that uh, a couple of years ago, our previous CEO, Jochen Zeitz, as well, had the same ideas which were discussed, that we need a uh, systemic transformation on product, production, and processes. And, um, you know, um, he was thinking, look, we take so many things just for granted. Whether this is water, we just learned how less water we actually have, whether this is the air we breathe. Um, and, you know, we, we just take it as a given, the use of the ecosystem services. And nobody, nobody ever thought of putting financial figures or financial value attached to this. I mean, there were a lot of discussions in the World Business Council. So um, we had the dis uh, discussion, let's do it, or let's get it done. This was last year, actually in April, in May, we released the first results. And uh, this, this environmental profit and loss account, I'm not sure how much you know about it. And in two minutes, you know, you can't squeeze in that much, actually. Um, it's actually a revolutionary new form for accounting for environmental externalities. Um, it, and, um, um, our idea was to figure out uh, what actually, um, what kind of ecosystem service use we, Puma and its whole operations, as well as the entire supply chain have, um, and uh, tried to put financial, as I was already, <coughs> already saying, tried, tried to put financial figures beside. And that's, we came, or that's how we came up in May this year <coughs> with the results. Uh, for greenhouse gases and water. Um, and we are not ready with the EPN because just a part of it. We will release the, hopefully the complete environmental profit and loss account uh, by end of October, including all, uh, at least in our opinion, relevant environmental KPIs, which are relevant for us, for Puma and its operation, as well the entire su uh, supply chain from tier one down to tier four. And, Reina, what are the new things you've sort of found out as a result of entering into this process? Uh, you know, are there any particular risks around carbon water that you perhaps didn't know before? 
Um, I mean, maybe a few of us were guessing, but we were quite surprised, and you see this here uh, in the background. Uh, we found out that the majority of the impact lies in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. If we have a look at us, I mean, of course we contribute, but if we have a look at us, Puma and Puma's operation is just less, especially, in, for example, in terms of water. But the majority impact or the major, uh, the major impact is within the supply chain. Okay. This was pretty new for us, and especially going down to uh, the so-called tier three and the tier four suppliers, such, for example, you know, the, the cotton growers, the cattle farmers. And is there any particular regions where you're seeing water being a, a, a especially important, or, or even climate regulation getting faster than other regions when you look at, <coughs> when you map that across uh, Puma's sort of supply chain? Look, this will be the exercise when we have the full EPNL, okay. uh, because on the one on the one hand side we're just producing figures. Now we have to use the figures, okay. you know, to match to match hopefully the the entire supply chain. And this, of course, can only be done industry wide and not just we. And I mean, so we're sort of looking a little bit further forward now. But can you see any sort of big changes that Puma might start to make as a result of this better understanding now of of these sorts of risks? I mean, what we have done anyhow is already we have introduced a so-called scorecard, sustainability scorecard, yeah. this is how we call it, where we uh, put a reduction of eKPIs in it for us, Puma, Puma and Puma's operation, as well as all our suppliers. And this is, for example, 25% reduction in energy, water, waste, and of course, carbon dioxide. But it looks like, uh, I have a strong feeling, that because of the EPNL, when we have the final result, we certainly need to adjust this. Okay. Is there any sort of teams you, need, you now need to build more capacity into, uh, do you think? And uh, you know, do you need to put more effort in, in some of the things that are, the, the process has thrown we have, up? We have already started. We have already started with our suppliers, um, and, you know, capacity building. And actually, this is called it education. This is actually the, the biggest issue to make them understand that sustainability, first of all, I need to understand the term sustainability, but that sustainability is not a cost center rather than a profit center. Okay. Yeah, uh, but it is coming, it is coming. And Richard, I mean, it's quite a unique approach still, isn't it? Um, can you tell us a bit about other companies you're aware of that are interested in making moves into this space and potentially making this sort of statement? And do you think, is this, a, is, is this sort of something that's just a pocket of progress uh, in, in one area, or, or is this a real step change, do you think, in taking us towards a, a much better internalization of, of, of the, the environmental costs we, so, we see so often externalized? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are plenty of uh, companies that uh, are looking at the link between environmental issues and financial issues. Um, it's just how you manifest that and how, how you consider that um, at the board level, essentially. Um, so, really, what the, the crux of the issue is for most companies that we've spoken to is how does certain environmental issues affect the economy and the raw materials they rely on and how they do business? How does it affect the future cash flows, for example? How can you incorporate some of this information into calculations of net present value of a business? Um, one of the uh, key issues that exist today is that um, Issues such as water scarcity are not correctly priced in the market. So we did a study for UBS where we found no correlation between local water scarcity and the market price of water. And essentially what that means is that when you're buying goods um, that rely on water, soft commodities or other raw materials that are water intensive. Mm. Sure. Has everyone caught that last bit? You could, hear, you could hear Richard. Did everyone hear that? Right, okay, good, thanks. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, Gary. Um, so there's, in other words, there's no price signal feeding through value chains of major businesses whose raw materials, goods, and services rely on water. Um, and so therefore, this is quite a, a key issue to business models as a whole. So we are finding uh, quite a lot of companies considering um, issues such as water, um, climate regulation, and various other types of issues feeding through, um, and how that feeds into their business thinking in general. Okay. And on the water bit, so, uh, you know, price is certainly an element, element, element of this, but, I mean, I suppose what every company's trying to do is trying to assess the vulnerability of watersheds in relation to their supply chain. They're trying to look at what, are the, what is the strength or weakness of governance 
in those regions? Are competing water users working together with local authorities to make sure watersheds are protected so that the, the business risk is reduced and you know, business cont continuity can, is, is sort of threatened less? I, I mean, does that sort of come into this sort of approach or is that a, do you think that's a separate sort of piece of work that needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key, key challenges is around collaboration because um, one, one of the findings in terms of this study on the EPNL is that a lot of the um, water use and a lot of the water externality, if you like, is located quite far away from, from Puma's own operations, which means that you need more transparency and traceability throughout value chains. You need more information flowing because markets actually operate pretty efficiently provided there's sufficient information flowing to inform decision making. And at the moment, we're seeing that actually what's happening is uh, you have tipping points whereby, for example, last year, a massive drought in Russia caused a hike in the price of wheat. Eight kilos of wheat feed into one kilo of beef, um, which affects the market price of food. It affects the cost of leather. It affects a whole range of different things. And it, and it also affects um, uh, some of the, the issues that we've actually seen in the Middle East uh, over the, the last six to nine months. So um, these are key major structural issues that will require collaboration. Um, they'll require um, collaboration such as, you know, if you rely on a raw material, it's likely that you have probably not a competitor but another business that relies on a, a similar type of material whereby combining forces you can start to influence um, uh, that, that point in the chain, if you like. And are you able to share with us other companies that are interested in making this sort of statement? Um, I can't name names at the moment, <laughs> but I, I think, I think that it would be no surprises to say that it's several of the major companies across a huge diversity of different sectors. Right. Actually. And, I mean, for either one of you, you, what you've used in the statement is the social cost of carbon, which I think is something we all prefer to see. That's the true cost. Um, however, is it less material because you've not used uh, the current price at which carbon is traded at in things like the emissions trading, trading scheme in Europe? Does that make it any less material to the business? Um, I mean, what I would say is that the, uh, I, th I think it's quite a sensible move to be precautionary to use the social cost of things like carbon and water and other types of environmental factors and social factors because the market price of carbon today in trading schemes does not necessarily reflect um, change in behaviors. It doesn't reflect the impact of climate change, nor does it reflect um, you know, what is going to drive business decision making and the potential cost. Uh, that actually comes through. So, for example, looking at the social cost of water is more indicative of potential rises to input costs as a consequence of water um, with respect to um, raw material costs than, say, looking at the market price of water, which quite often is a fraction of, of what it should be. Uh, Reiner, what are the implications for your suppliers? I mean, if you're finding out that some of the suppliers are really, really high carbon, high, high water in terms of the, the costs that you're sort of looking at, does that mean you're going to drop them like a hot brick? Are you going to bully them into driving down these externalities? Uh, how, how are you going to respond to that? No, we certainly don't drop them like a hot brick. Um, <laughs> um, fun enough, we had last week a supplier summit in Germany where I presented actually the results and the suppliers were positively surprised and shocked, put it this way to see that they are actually the ones causing these problems. Um, but uh, what I'm going to, uh, going to say is there is a move in the industry. There's a move in the suppliers, which is being recognized. You know, a lot of them actually see the business case, what I was already mentioning, uh, that sustainability can be profitable. So they really start changing step by step. Uh, we have to take into consideration that the situations we face, mainly in Asia, are different compared to, to Europe. You know, in Germany, you get subsidies for photovoltaic, for example. There's nothing available. You know, uh, but more and more really come up with ideas uh, to support this. And uh, if I'm allowed to say, <clears throat> when we talk about sustainability, we are talking here about the, the green side or the environmental sustainability. Our next approach will be, and actually we have started already, uh, not only thinking of it, will be the so-called SPNL or the social profit and loss where we will include 
um, you know, factors like the wage issue, which is, I mean, you know, sporting goods industry is always under fire, the working conditions, and and, and so that we, or, or our aim will be to balance the social and environmental sustainability. Right. Okay. In, in looking into the long term, um, Rainer, I mean, we hear about companies now uh, looking at decoupling their growth from environmental impacts. Is Puma any closer to making commitments around absolute carbon reductions, absolute uh, management of its water footprint, do you think? Um, I mean, obviously, you're a growing business. Do you think you're sort of getting in that direction? I mean, last year we have introduced uh, our, now, uh, our new goal back, back on the attack approach of uh, 4 billion euro until uh, 2015, uh, which does not mean that we will reduce uh, our sustainability efforts, mm. just the other way around. I think it needs a, it needs a robust uh, sustainability approach through our uh, scorecard, as I was saying, which might be a little bit adjusted to make it a little bit uh, uh, stringent. Uh, we, we will set ourselves goals. We know that these are not easy to achieve, but um, Puma is already carbon neutral. So, you know, Puma's operations worldwide is carbon neutral. We have set, uh, we have set ourselves the goal of this 25% uh, reduction. And we have as well some incentives, uh, you know, to make it happen, put it this way, that, you know, um, because everything is money related, uh, all our general managers worldwide have a part of their bonus, corporate, you know, which is directly coupled uh, to our sustainability, or to, to their sustainability. Um, achievements. And it just strikes me in the foot sector, uh, the footwear sector, that I mean, there is a lot of progress being made. Puma's doing some great stuff. Nike and Timberland, we hear a lot of on the conference circuit. Why is it that, that footwear companies are taking this so seriously? And, and I mean, do you think you, of yourselves are more of a progressive sector than others? And, and why would that, what, if that's the case, why why is this happening? I can just assume. I mean, if you have, uh, if you just look a bit, uh, a little bit into history. Uh, the sporting goods company, whether this is uh, the Nike, the Adidas, or us, we are pretty, pretty open in the media simply due, to <coughs> simply due to the labor conditions where we produce. So, um, and therefore it's actually s simply expected from, from consumers, from NGOs, you know, not only the labor, as well as the, <coughs> as well as the environment or vice versa. Okay, and then in this conference, we've talked a lot about the need to um, share experiences, work a, a bit more collaboratively um, across sectors and, and, and work with other companies. I mean, that's quite tough, isn't it? I intellectual property tends to be king. Every company likes to protect um, its know-how. Um, and yet, probably what needs to happen is collective action. Um, and we know that Nike and Puma have made efforts to work together more closely. There's the Green Exchange and other things. But these things, I think, are... Uh, have limited success. I mean, can you see yourselves in future either working with footwear companies much, much more closely to, to share know-how to, so you're not reinventing the wheel? Uh, or, or is there other companies uh, in other sectors? We are working together. We are working together. <clears throat> you might recall that Greenpeace came up with a uh, detox campaign you know, uh, all over Europe. We are working together in several organizations, whether this, uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition with all major brands on the footwear sector as well. Uh, I mean, the thing is, we are sitting in one boat, and sustainability actually should not be taken as a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's actually moving to this way. Mm. Uh, I mean, if we want to achieve our goals, we have to work together as an industry cooperation. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, that's been a, a fantastic story. It, it is a, a revolutionary step forward in this agenda. Um, Reiner, Richard, I want to thank you very, very much for joining us and sharing your experiences. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Paul Lynn, could we have Paul Lynn, please, from BYD Auto? Uh, welcome, Paul. Have a seat. Thank you very much. It's great to, to see you here. Thank you, Nats. Um, now, BYD, I think I'm right in saying, is the sixth largest automotive manufacturer in China? Yes, we rank it as the uh, sixth biggest auto brand in China last year, okay. 2010. Um, for those people in the audience who perhaps don't know BYD also, could you sort of tell us a bit about what the company does? And I'm giving a little bit away here, but um, why, what made the company originally 
choose to go fully electric? Um, we are mainly coming from a battery business founded in 1995 and listed in Hong Kong stock market by 2002. We are ranked as the number one battery supplier by volume in the world. And we are supplying about nickel series battery, about 70% of the worldwide, and 30% of the lithium battery used in the mobile phone, and around 15% of the battery used in the laptops in the world. And the reason we go for auto business is because we want to combine the battery technology and the cart chassis technology together. That's a pure electric vehicle. So we entered into auto business beginning from 2003 and we launched our first uh, new energy vehicle earlier in 2007 and come to this time. And uh, strategic in investor, Mr. Warren Buffett, take around 10% of the company share. Warren Buffett has from, 10% of your Yeah, right. from 2008. Okay, and it, it, do you find his stake in the company is helping? Uh, uh, yes, you actually the company become well known and become right. uh, globally after that. Yeah, and can you give us an idea of how fast the, the company is growing in China? How, how many, what's the sales figures in in China, how many electric vehicles are being sold now? From, from um, this no, we are, still in, we are still selling a lot of the gasoline car in China. We sold about uh, 600,000 pieces in 2010. So 600,000 electric vehicles? No, uh, gasoline car. Gasoline cars. Uh, among them is around 1.5% is pure electric car. Okay, so yeah. in China, the total sales is 1.5% is electric vehicles at the, at the moment. Sorry, is it? Um, it is around 7,000 less. Okay, all right, okay. 1% of the 600,000. Okay. Um, I think HSBC had a report out recently. They expect that by 2020, the, the growth in, in sales of electric vehicles will increase by about 20-fold, um, which sort of sounds good. Uh, can you give us an idea of around the world, what is the sort of you know, growth of electric vehicles in comparison to, to regular petrol vehicles? Um, electric vehicle actually is a, it's not a new product. Uh, it's, it, uh, it appeared maybe 20 years ago, but at that time, the battery technology is not good enough to support <coughs> the car go f goes for longer distance. But it's growing very fast in the last, last five years. Especially uh, the most important things is the society and the OEM companies have clarified what's the future roadmap for the new energy vehicle. I think that's the most important things. We have the design that most of the company design the pure electric vehicle and the range extender plug-in electric vehicle will be the mainstream in okay. the coming future. Uh, pure electric vehicle, they have the two different type of pure electric vehicle. One is, we call it pure electric vehicle for public transportation, mm -hmm. which is very long range, and uh, it can be very easily be popularized by uh, the supporting from certain location quick charger, right. and go around the cities. Uh, this business model actually is very important because public transportation electric vehicle is safe more carbon over emission in the city because every taxi it go for time 10 times more than private car per day it go for 300 kilometers per day right. or comparing with the private car go for 30 kilometers probably and secondly is the short range electric vehicle is rolling uh, which the combined range in the city is around 10 100 kilometers to 150 kilometers. Uh, so short range, this is for personal consumption, is it? This yes, we think so. Okay. That's for personal consumption. You can e use a very easier charger to, e to, to put it in home. And just tell us the range again. The it's around, normally the, the, the available products in the market is around 100 kilometers to 150 kilometers in combined range. Okay, all right. Yeah. And where are the big growth markets in, in electric vehicles? Um, uh, the, the biggest market nowadays, uh, we can see after some products being launched, America, uh, China, and European 
including UK. Okay. It's the biggest market. And what, do the, what conditions create growth? Is it government support, policy support in, in terms of financial incentives? Is it infrastructure issues? Or is it, um, I mean, in this country, we hear about behavior change. I mean, unfortunately, Jeremy Clarkson's doing a, a electric vehicles a massive disservice, not helping with behavior change uh, amongst consumers. Um, what are the conditions that are particularly useful to, 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 to grow markets? Um, the three market, American market, China, and Europe, Europe is is different market. American market is just it's a very good market for I just mentioned the short range pure electric vehicle because it's easily be charged in their home garage. And EU uh, Europe market and China market is a little similar. Uh, let's say Europe market is half and a half. It's very the, the public transportation is very important, especially inside a city. So um, to, to in, in China market is more different. China market is kind of the conflict between the development of auto industry and the, the limited resource of petroleum that cause energy security. And actually what helps to, for this kind of market it is the policy of course, the first of all. And secondly, I think the important thing is the education, um, how to educate the consumer to accept the new products. And then... So in Europe, we need to be, we, we're a bit of Philistines in Europe, we need to be educated much more than the, 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 the yes, people in the no, US. It, it can be driven not only by the OEM maker, but right. also by the society, by okay. the, the government. Right. And also, um, uh, the, the, red, the products, the right products, the ready products, yeah. is also very important. Okay. I mean, the other thing we, came, we heard about in a recent report um, was that... Um, the sort of cost for buying electric vehicles is going to remain um, higher than conventional vehicles till about 2030. I don't know if that's something that you're looking at. It was probably a, a report around Europe. I mean, do you see um, either the cost of EVs coming down or, or, or because of rising fuel costs, maybe you can see that the, the, the total running of electric vehicles is starting to, will become more competitive? Uh, the, the, the initial cost of the car, of, of the pure electric vehicle, is more expensive than gasoline car. Of course, for daily cost, it's going to come lower. Right. But uh, we think the cost of the car, after being mass produced eventually, the cost of the battery will, will drop, but not a lot, around 20% to 30%. So that's our, what we are thinking in the initially, in the first beginning, the government subsidize, uh, subsidy can help to support the, 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 the dropping different of the battery. Okay. And eventually, we can still survive without the subsidies. Okay. And I mean, this debate around electric vehicles versus combustion engines sort of it carries on. I think most of us understand that the, the carbon footprint is mainly in the use of vehicles rather than the production of um, vehicles. But there is quite a lot of press around the impacts around producing um, the lithium batteries that you were talking about, producing electric vehicles as potentially being a bit more impactful than regular combustion engines. Uh, we also hear about rare earth materials and um, there's been a bit of a stranglehold on that and also impacts of using rare earth materials. Can you just talk us through a little bit about those sorts of impacts in the production process? Um, sure. There's always some comments about the uh, transition of, of was talking about the electric, electrified transportation is kind of transition from pipe pollution to coal pollution or somebody are talking about is coming from uh, the using pollution to manufacturing pollution. But actually, when you produce this uh, battery pack, especially, we are using the technology, we call it lithium iron first phase. They're using two core elements. One is lithium, one is ferrous. Ferrous un is unpolluted and tall. Mm -hmm. And lithium, actually, it can be easily recycled after the battery out of its life. And secondly, as about the transi transition of pipe pollution to coal pollution, some people talk about. Actually, uh, the efficiency coming from uh, the 
coal to electricity, electricity to the motor, to mm -hmm. motor to the wheel, mm -hmm. is much more higher. It can reach more than 30%. Comparing with well to tank, tank to wheel is around only 12%. Okay. So actually for the electric vehicle, the efficient, energy efficiency is very, very high. Right, okay. Um, we heard from Reiner that, you know, actually footwear companies are increasingly work, trying to work together. I mean, sustainability is also becoming a competitive issue. I think Reiner sort of mentioned that. With yourself, I mean, working with other automotive car manufacturers, is, is, is that possible? Or are you finding in your industry you really need to protect your intellectual property, your, your know-how and your experience? Um, we are open. Actually, BYD is quite open. We are consider ourselves as a battery company and semi-auto company. Actually, we work with Volkswagen. We work with Daimler. Uh, we JV with Daimler in China to, to develop a new uh, pure electric vehicle. Uh, we provide their heart, the powertrain, and Daimler is providing the, the body. They're going to be launched in the market by 2013, very soon. Yeah. yeah. So we are quite open for that. And it, I mean, if you were lobbying for new rules in the US or Europe or, or Asia, I mean, what is the big sort of bits, pieces of, of, of gov government policy support that would be useful for someone like BYD also who's trying to increase its market share? In the first beginning, we think is the, uh, is the subsidy for buying a pure electric vehicle. Uh, that's important to make the, the first buyer will not feel free or oh, eventually whether the price of the car will dropping down uh, so when I, when I sell my uh, used car, I'm going to lose a lot. But when I have the subsidy, that's fine. Mm. Uh, secondly, is we think uh, it's very important for the government or for the, a country to, to combine the OEM manufacturer and the facility company together. Uh, that's very important because it's something about uh, echo first or chicken first. Uh, the facility company are always waiting for enough pure electric vehicle running on the street, and we are waiting for their quick charging station ready. Okay. So um, the government can help to combine the both parties together and sit down and talk. Okay. Who's going to pay for the quick charge? Uh, it actually, it's a very profitable business for a long term. Right. So usually, uh, utility company is quite happy with that business. Can you see BYT moving out of selling cars and vehicle uh, and batteries into to leasing these things, uh, jumping into a more service model, or is that something that already uh, happens? Yes, of course, leasing or car sharing is yeah. a very good business. But basically, if you are doing our new products yeah. and using a hundred percent different business model, probably it's even harder for the consumer to accept it. It's easier to go both ways to acting as a normal gasoline car. Where, when might, are we going to see BYD auto uh, autos in, in, uh, in the UK? Uh, hopefully very soon. We're yeah. gonna, we, we are actually not only making cars, we are making bus right. uh, and making a lot of things. Actually, we're going to have some bus being tested here and in London very soon. Okay, well, Paul, I think we wish you and BYD Auto every success. Again, thank you very much for coming all the way here to share your experiences. Uh, Paul Lin, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, Melanie. Uh, we're moving now from, uh, I guess we're staying in transport of, of sorts, but uh, we're moving from overland transport to overseas transport. Um, Melanie, thanks for coming. Um, Shipping is, uh, international shipping is responsible, if many will collect, correct me if I'm wrong, for about 2.7% uh, of global emissions, um, which actually is highly efficient because, uh, as Melanie, Melanie and others tell me, 90% uh, of all trade actually is transported by sea. So in that respect, a massively effective business. Um, however, of course, I think what we're seeing on the, on the horizon is, you know, as with many sectors, massive growth in emissions from this sector. Um, so, um, Melanie, you're with Valinia's Wilhelms and Logistics. I will probably now use WWL from now on. Um, but can you tell us what WWL is doing in this space to, to reach for zero carbon? Yeah. 
Uh, I think we recognize the opportunities abound. Um, what we see in the future, the International Maritime Organization has said that without policy intervention, by 2050, shipping emissions may rise by 150 to, to 200 percent uh, from today. So uh, you could look at that as a grave concern, and we'd like to look at that as an opportunity. If we can do that better than anyone else, then surely our customers will love us, and they'll be the ones who, uh, who will help us drive this new behavior in the shipping industry. So we're aiming for zero. Uh, what makes it significant is that we've come up with a concept vessel of what zero might look like. And uh, it's a nice and it's a pretty picture and it's aspirational. But we actually took the step, we did this picture in 2004. And in 2009, we actually took the step to turn this into a roadmap. So looking at it from a technology perspective, an energy perspective, and an operational perspective and then looking that in the context of a commercial reality, which is how we make money and uh, how we perform for our customers. So zero is an ambition, uh, but we need some time to get there. We need to work with our customers, with ports, et cetera, technology development to, to be able to reach that target. And I mean, ships are sometimes in service for up to 30 years. So how, do you, how on earth do you keep up with the technology? I mean, technology is probably changing all the time. How does that sort of, how do you square that with, with ships being in service for so long? Uh, in terms of technology development, it probably doesn't happen as fast as you think. Right. Uh, so there's steps so far in the shipping industry to make these changes. Uh, what we see is the next kind of major drivers will be a, an energy change. Uh, there's some regulations coming up in shipping that relate very much to uh, pollutant emissions, for example, SOX and NOx. And that's actually, we believe, going to drive some change in, in energy carriers. Uh, that will drive some of the change in machinery and designs for the future. Uh, the Panama Canal widening will also allow us to extend the width of vessels for the future and, uh, and allow us to get somewhere closer to that zero emissions picture. Can you talk about slow steaming? How does that work? How, how, how prolific is it in the sector and within WWL? Yeah, uh, slow steaming, the, the curve for uh, energy consumption against power or speed is quite steep uh, when it comes to our types of vessels. So companies have used it as a, a tactic during this, uh, during this recession to bring down cost and also to bring down emissions. And where we see its role for the future is actually, in order for us to reach this idea of zero at some stage, we're looking at 2040 on our roadmap, we need to actually half the speed of, of our vessels as of today. And uh, if we were to do that within five years, uh, we probably wouldn't have that many customers <laughs> left over. Right. So, uh, this is a, yeah, so this is a, a huge change, a huge shift for supply chains for the future if we're to look at bringing this curve down in order to save the energy in the first place. I mean, it's, it's strange because obviously uh, clients of yours need their cargoes arriving on time. They need speed. But at the same time, I guess some of your clients are also trying to look at lowering their carbon emissions in the supply chain. Are there not sort of joint wins in, in slowing down the, the, the w w when that helps? Uh, would it not benefit their own carbon reduction targets if, if you were slowing down? Yeah, I think what we're seeing uh, in the last four years, I've moved from having maybe one handful of customers requesting and requiring uh, transparency in their supply chain emissions from, from shipping to two hands and a foot. So it's growing in terms of the transparency that our customers are requiring of us in order for them to see what's going on, particularly in the shipping emissions. And I think that will help us make these decisions in the future with our customers about where we can save carbon and where we can save, uh, save cost. Okay, uh, a joint report from Oxfam and, and WWF I think came out quite recently and suggested that really what has to happen is carbon pricing needs to be applied to shipping to drive down emissions, but also to raise funds, I think, for adaptation for, uh, to climate change. I mean, how does that sort of fit with you? Is it, is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a price for carbon. Um, in our industry, it's, it's already on the table at the International Maritime Organization. Uh, there's currently eight or nine proposals, I think, for how a market-based measure could be applied to international shipping. Um, I don't know what the appropriate number would be for where that cost level should be. But uh, from our perspective, what it should drive is change behavior. Yeah. It should drive some funds actually coming back 
also into shipping to create the technology change that we need for the future. Would WWL and before a, a carbon pricing that's applied? Would you be for, for uh, that sort of effort, that sort of move to... Yeah, to, I yeah. think with the conditions of it being uh, an internationally right. uh, applied gotcha. uh, market-based measure, I think yeah. that's important for us in, in global shipping. Um, and to be flag neutral is one of the very important components of how we run our international business. Um, so like I said, I don't know what the right number yeah. should be, but uh, it's an appropriate measure. Uh, the International Maritime Organization also introduced some Energy Efficiency Design Index, which is a new measure for the future. So that'll place limitations on uh, the types of designs for the future. Okay. And in aviation, it seems as though that uh, there are moves being made towards a global deal around CO2. Uh, I mean, it's, it seems like it's still sort of a lot of uh, number crunching to, to do, but in the shipping sector, uh, are, we any sort of, uh, are we sort of close to looking at some sort of global deal around carbon across the sector? I, I think this was one of the first steps the International Maritime Organization made just this past July when they introduced this Energy Efficiency Design Index, which is an internationally applicable measure yeah, yeah. and, again, flag neutral. Um, there are some concessions, if you like, in that particular policy, but at least it's a, it's a step towards this, this different future. Right. Um, they also introduced a mandatory shipping energy efficiency management plan, which is a new measure, another piece of uh, regulation for our vessels to manage on board, but uh, I think it's appropriate and positive. Right. I mean, so, you know, you talked about the sort of emissions are sort of potentially sort of going to be growing from this sector. Uh, are we any sort of closer to getting towards absolute carbon reductions? Uh, are, there any sort of, are there any sort of breakthrough innovations that, that can sort of get us moving in that direction? I think, um, just like was pointed out in one of the earlier sessions, there's some spot innovations that are happening in the sector. Uh, pulling those all together, scaling them up for the, for the bigger vessels will take some time, there's no doubt about it. Um, but again, just to come back to, to energy consumption, that, mm. that speed element is a huge part of right. the types of technology. By reducing that speed element, that's a huge part of how quickly we can then push other technology uh, to bring it closer towards a zero future. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, the other thing we keep hearing about is sort of things like solar sails and high-rise high kites that are, are, are working at high altitudes that power part of shipping, you know, need, power needs and so on, and tidal power. Are, are these pipe dreams or are, are these innovations really starting to sort of take off? Yeah, I think they're realities. Right. And uh, I think the, the current global fleet of ships is 100,000 uh, ships around the world. So uh, it's, whilst it's a shipping industry, yeah. uh, there's a lot of, or a variety of different types of ships in that, in that number. So I think that some of these technologies will be very specific for types of ships. Uh, but the energy source could be the same. So yes. For example, sails. Uh, so our vessels typically won't use this kite arrangement, but we're looking at fixed wing sails okay. or adding something on the front of the vessels in order to create lift. So utilizing the energy source yes. is, is common, but how we do it will be very specific. So Melanie, to wrap up, I mean, as far as you're concerned, WWL is probably ahead of the game. Is that fair to say? I get paid to say yes to questions like <laughs> Stupid that. Stupid question, really. <laughs> no, but I think uh, what puts us ahead is that we've actually aimed for zero. Right. And uh, yes, it is aspirational, and yes, yeah. it's a, this big elephant, uh, but we've also come up with how we're going to eat it up. Right. Um, and I think uh, we can't do it alone. That's, that's no doubt about it. We need some of these untraditional um, relationships and partnerships, et cetera, to take us forward. Yeah. But uh, at least we've, we've got the guiding star for the future. Okay, Melanie, uh, thank you for sharing all your insights. Very kind of you. Thank you very much, um, Melanie. Thank you. Uh, Tracy Curra is uh, co founder of Ecomodo. We thought we need to talk to big um, businesses uh, like WWL and, and Melanie. Welcome, Tracy. Um, but we also really need to talk to you know, potential innovative disruptors. Do you mind being called uh, an innovative disruptor? Um, an innovator, yes. Okay, not a disruptor. Not quite it's yet. It's a bit too no. mischievous, isn't it? Well, you know. Um, so, um, Tracy, it's funny because in the UK, in the London conference circuit, for years now, we've, thought, we've, we've heard from the big retailers who constantly talk about the idea of perhaps leasing lawnmowers and leasing power drills because we don't use these things every day. We buy them, they stay in the cupboard, they get used twice a year, and then they get thrown away. 
And, um, but, you know, we've very rarely heard big players jumping into this space. Ecomodo, your business, so, so is, is actually doing this stuff. We're, we're tr okay, we're taking the first steps to doing this. Right. And um, you asked me here today to talk about dematerialized business, and we are a business, and we are completely dematerialized insofar as we own no assets at all apart from our web platform. Mm -hmm. And um, our first step into this space is actually to get everyday people sharing the stuff that's already there, out, that's already been purchased, that's already sitting in cupboards, sheds, attics, um, under the bed, in all the houses that already li live in, our, in, in, in the UK. Mm. So, so far there's 31 billion pounds worth of unused goods in the UK in households. If you start multiplying that up with the unused goods that are in you know, schools, community centres, um, hospitals, businesses, retail mm. um, and you actually start you know even in the UK we have a huge amount of stuff that's just actually already sitting there the energy's already been burnt but it's just not getting utilized but how are you able to break into this new approach when the, the larger players are sort of struggling um, <laughs> um, we're in we're in a very interesting space because we are a startup um, so we don't have all of the issues of having stakeholders and investors that we have to convince mm. um, and Ecomodo pretty much started out as a social experiment so we um, back in 2007 we had this interesting idea we actually saw kind of three very convergent trends happening one of it was the rise of social media mm. so people starting to come together and share online um, the, the other one was the fact that um, there was it was obvious that there was potential collapse in the economy and um, with the environment, people looking for new things to do um, to be to live more sustainably. So we brought those kind of three things together and um, started thinking about actually how can we, what do we need to put in place in order to bring everyday folk together to um, share. Now, this isn't a new concept. Um, I'm here talking supposedly about something that's revolutionary. I wouldn't say what we're doing is revolutionary, it's more re-evolutionary mm -hmm. because we're pretty much bringing back um, something that 50 years ago in this country we did. We borrowed, we knew who up the road had long ladders and who could help with a bit of plumbing or whatever and we did this and what's happened is actually we've moved from this, that situation in the last 50 years to to the kind of you know complete over consumerism we all have to have this need to go and buy everything mm. when actually it's just not necessarily the case so we're just literally starting out and trying to think you know, you know get people doing things differently how do you create the behavior change for this to really scale up because as you say most of us unfortunately are stuck in thinking we want yep. to buy and own stuff i mean <laughs> It strikes it's, me as a massive challenge to get it's, this it's, cultural change. It's, it's a, so, so basically, with, our, with the research we did, we've, we, we kind of looked at lots of quite diverse um, types of people. Um, so using our service, people can lend their stuff for free, so they can just help their neighbours out. Um, they can make a little bit of money for themselves, so they can rent out their own stuff. Mm. Um, but they can also donate their earnings to um, a good cause, and our good causes can be any not-for-profit group. Mm. We've got 54 people that have signed up so far. We'd love to get the WWF, um, <laughs> but we do have so far people like Friends of the Earth, the Prince's Trust. But we also have a couple of school PTAs that are starting to get parents to share, yeah. um, to fundraise for the school. And these kind of things actually do motivate people, and 49% of our transactions so far has been for charity fundraising. Lots of consumer goods and retailing companies in the audience. Is there anything you can tell us about which products does this work especially well for so, and, and, and which ones does this not really work so, for? So basically, um, in, um, there's a lady called Rachel Botsman who's just um, released, um, released a book which is called What's Mine Is Yours. Sorry, went out my head for a second. <laughs> um, and basically in the book, she's, um, she's been doing a lot of research around this space and she was saying that 90% of the goods that we own, we just don't use every month. Mm. So obviously that 90% is probably pretty much the good, the good stuff to earmark first. Right. Um, and you know the 10%, you know, I have my mobile phone, everyone probably uses their mobile phone lots of times a day. These things, because actually they get a lot of use. And what we're trying to do is actually raise the idling capacity of these products, increase the use to life cycle uh, ratio that's out there, 
Um, and actually, we can do that predominantly much more around the 90% more than the 10% that are actually already getting use, so mm -hmm. a lot of use. Um, you know, again, I mentioned that lots of large retailers are talking about jumping to this space, but something's holding them back. It's tough times at the moment. It is I mean, tough times. Can Thank you see yourselves as either um, sharing your know-how with, with, with the likes of the big players, the high street players? Mm -hmm. Could you see yourselves in partnership with them? I mean, you know, we, would, we would love to, to work in partnership with them. Um, basically, what's, what's kind of interesting out there is, for me, it's not... I don't, personally, I don't think if, if retail just moves to being rental, it's not going to actually change the behavior that we need to change. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to have something more than that. Um, it's like we were having a quick discussion earlier um, about design addresses, and I've been doing a... Doing I'm not uh, <laughs> spreading any rumors here, Tracy. No, Only at, at the weekends is when I wear um, my design but, address. But basically, I've, I've been <laughs> just doing a little um, look into some... I, I'm not an environmentalist, I'm a designer, and we're both yeah. designers um, that, that started up Ecomodo. So I'm having to learn a lot in yeah. the environmental space. So I've just been doing a little bit of um, looking at some recent research that's been done around... Um, environmental behavior change and using value modes in order to push that yeah. and um, one of the issues and kind of just taking that and thinking about it in relationship to collaborative consumption um, for me I'm, I'm a little concerned we don't know if this will happen but I'm a little concerned that actually if somebody goes out and, and rents a design address um, because they want to be seen to be in a particular place you know, a, a, an event or whatever, then actually that could, because it's hitting that aspirational point for them, that actually that could push them to go and purchase more designer dre or more dresses from that particular designer. And that actually is then counterproductive to what our kind of end, end games are. So for me, I don't think it's just about moving retail to rental. I think there's something more than that. And I think what we can actually do to bring bring to the table with, you know, you know we're little, they're huge, yeah. um, is actually the kind of sense of um, community and social interaction that we, that we can help deliver. Because for us, it's not just about, um, we're not just about kind of helping neighbours share. We're starting to get... Um, We've, we've, we've got a bunch of people from councils that are starting to sign up just to share stuff within council buildings. We're working with libraries. Um, we're working with schools. So actually, we're really seeing that, that you know, our platform can help every tier and all sorts of different types of organizations to actually start, you know, start getting on the sharing wagon. So the large companies approaching you, what you bring to the table is uh, you have a, a better experience of how communities work and, but and how you can... But it's also what, what we have is we have um, a, a, a piece of underlying infrastructure that can be, you know, utilized to make this behavior more commonplace. Right. Um, and we can work together to think through new business models um, you know, because we're out there, and one, I don't know if my pictures are coming up, but one of the pictures up that, that are up there is um, a favorite illustrator of mine called Richard Stein, and it has a, a, a cavern with yes, no, maybe. Yes. And I think taking with any innovation, with any doing anything new, especially if you're in a large corporation with lots of stakeholders, jumping from no to yes across the chasm is a really, really big step. What we can help them do is think about what that maybe could be. It might be just prototyping something in a particular local area, thinking how they can actually get into different things as opposed, you know, different places as opposed to just direct to consumer, all sorts of different, you know, schools or whatever. Okay, just I a think. Just a whole bunch of different things, really. Thank you very much, thank Tracy. You for your we better time. wrap Appreciate up there. It. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, a very quick wrap-up before I hand back to Charles. Um, so what we heard was a fascinating story by Tracy, who I think is telling us that we can go down the dematerialized route, but we need leasing models to be accompanied with um, efforts on mo driving more conscious consumption. We had uh, Wallinius, Wilhelm, and WWL, um, where, where Melanie told us about breakthrough innovations that can get the shipping sector moving in the right direction. BY Auto, um, BYD Auto is, you know, electric vehicles is a bit of a step change towards lower carbon mobility. And Puma's uh, environmental profit and loss statement, a step change towards um, internalizing externalities. Um, Charles, back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Dax. I'm tempted to ask, after that series of interviews, who got the job? It did it seem a little bit like that. Um, uh, now we're going to move on to 
a, a finance perspective. So we've had sort of, sort of various inspiring examples. I think there might be questions about how much these add up to our fundamental goal of reaching zero. But of course, we know that all of these things are going to be made far more difficult if we're unable to mobilize capital uh, at scale uh, and, and speedily. Uh, and so in order to give us a finance perspective on some of these issues, I'd like to call on Michael Eckhart, who is the Global Head for Envi Environmental Finance and Sustainability at Citigroup. Michael. Well, good afternoon. Um, I uh, joined Citigroup uh, about six months ago, having retired as the uh, founder and president of the American Council on Renewable Energy, ACOR. Uh, how many of you have had any interaction with ACOR? Now that well, someone here in England. Thank you, several, thank you. Um, so uh, we are running a bit late, so uh, I'll just have a brief speech here representing Citi. And, and rather than giving you a lecture on finance, which you're going to have tomorrow in the finance session, talk about finance, I thought I would take this opportunity to share the city perspective on the whole sustainability question <clears throat> more broadly. First, yeah, it's there. Uh, first, just one slide on city. Uh, if you don't know us too well, uh, really is a, the reason I joined city is, is the scope is amazing, operating in 160 countries. Uh, in our various bank accounts around the world, we're moving $3 trillion a day, uh, which is a, a number that just sticks in my mind. The opportunity to, to move capital from this base of city uh, globally is, is really tremendous. And so I really left the nonprofit sector to go towards finance, which is where I'd been in the early part of my career, in order to walk the talk. For 10 years, I've been talking about the need to scale up finance and how to do that, and I decided maybe it's time that I actually go walk that talk. I've given you the name here on the lower left of Niels Kirk, uh, who is here in London, couldn't be here today. And also, I should uh, just take a moment to thank the organizers. I was supposed to actually be in the finance session tomorrow, uh, but got called a couple of weeks ago. I have to be in Athens tomorrow, uh, dealing with the Greek situation, which could even blow up tomorrow. So uh, Niels Kirk here in London heads uh, utility and chairs our climate committee. So please be in touch with Niels uh, on all these issues, as well as myself. OK, for one slide on drivers of change, population, you know that. The one I love, and you can't see all the numbers, this is just visualization, but the one in the upper right says that today, the United, the United States and Europe represent or contribute 60% of the middle class wealth of the world. And in 2050, China, India, and other Asian nations will represent 60% and we will represent 10. This study is so fundamental to what's going on. I really think this is the best chart I've ever seen in my life that really explains what's about to happen in my children and your children's lifetime. And the lower, the lower right is visually all the yellow and, and red is where water is short, and I know you've talked about that. So we've got some serious drivers. City recognizes those drivers, and I'm here to say that if you read City's strategic plan, those charts are in it. Those charts drive where city is going, as you can imagine, with that population growth and changes in, in uh, middle class wealth. I'm here to say that city believes and is committed to the concept that the science is real. Even though we serve clients in all manner of the economy, we serve clients that don't accept that the science is real. You know that. that we, this is a, we're an industrial bank serving around the world. So we serve all kinds of clients. But city as an institution, without doubt, without question, Absolutely, to the last person, the science is real, we're there. Now, in government response mechanisms, this is where, you know, we're really burdened by the lack of, of a solution, the lack ever since Kyoto, and we wish we, there could have been a corporate participation in, in Kyoto even, and all the UNFCC and the IPCC processes and so on, and we're tracking along, of course, we'll participate. I'll be in Durban, um, both, with, both as a corporation and, and with an NGO, actually. Um, the European ETS is struggling along. China is committed to a low carbon economy. Okay, that's good. Uh, even Australia, I was in Australia last week, so Australia is even committed now to a carbon pricing regime. And, okay, this is good, but the answer on finance is finance, 
flows according to profits within the rules. If there are no rules, there is no flow. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'll be working on this. That's why City wants to work on this. Because we do want to move as a corporation in the direction of corporate sustainability. We do want to make a contribution working with our clients and through our clients to the whole global solution. But if we just stand back and allow government to continue talking and there are no rules, we can't finance anything. Yeah, nothing can be financed without knowing the rules. And so this is a message, the urgency of this. And we are focused on Rio plus 20. I don't know that we'll have a high profile of Rio plus 20 because it's a government meeting, it's a UN meeting. Our role is not to lead, ours is to be there and be supportive. But I will be there and a lot of city will be there. And we think it is vitally important that we not go past Rio plus 20 without a set of rules that the capital can follow. Uh, this little, on this slide also talks about the United States. It's, all, it's not as bad. I mean, where do we fail to agree? Well, we've got mayors. This is a map of all the mayor, the cities where, where mayors, we have almost 1,000 cities have committed to climate action. We have almost 1,000 presidents of colleges and universities in the U.S. have signed up for the president's climate commitment. We've got, we've got action all over the country. Well, the interesting thing is, at the local level, there's an alignment of benefits and costs. You can feel the cost, you, you know the cost, you can feel the benefits at a local level, cities, universities, and so on. But when you go above that level, the benefits disconnect from the cost. That's where you need to be working, is to connect at the presidential level of the United States, at the UN level of the world, is there's not a discussion, there's not an attachment of the concrete benefits with the costs of these changes. That's where I would point. Get the benefits attached at the global and national level. Climate solutions, I'm just putting up two here that, of course, you all know cold. I'm just reminding us that there is a lot of brain power at work. There are a lot of thoughtful people like yourself working on this, and we're working on this. But practical things like this, like the Princeton wedges, you know, a gigaton apiece, and, and the McKinsey um, waterfall charts of what we can do at a profit versus at a loss. Uh, these things, this is key thinking. We don't want to lose it. We want to keep it there, get it up front, and, and keep putting forward financeable solutions and not just big ideas, and again, tie the benefits and the cost. Now, a couple things on U.S. renewables. Um, this is both a positive chart and a negative chart. So here we are where the white line is, and, and we're, in the, we're in the vertical part of the S-curve. Um, you know, all things penetrate markets in a big S-curve. It sort of gets going slow, and then boom, gets going fast, and then matures. And so you see there, there's an S-curve. Uh, the green in that chart is the biomass, biofuels, that kind of thing. And the wind uh, is the blue. And what's wrong with that chart is the yellow is the solar. I, I want to point out something, that little thing about charts. You know why solar always shows up so small? Because I come out of the utility business too. Because in utility analysis, rooftop solar is not solar. It's reducing load. <laughs> they don't count it. And so uh, we need to change the way some of these statistics are done. So please, somebody please take that up and get the utility industry to, con to consider rooftop solar on the customer side of the meter as generation, which they need to mentally deal with and manage instead of ignoring and making, making believe it just goes away. So uh, if we just change that, solar will be bigger. But my own view, my own view, personal view, not a city view, my view is solar will be way bigger, th way bigger than wind, way bigger, uh, 10 times bigger uh, than, than wind not in my lifetime or yours, but over the next couple hundred years, I suspect there'll not be a roof on earth that's not made of PV, or just to plant the seed, uh, not a highway, not a highway on earth that's not made of PV. Think about that. And, and the, way, the way prices are going, I got an email this morning that at PVSec in Europe, the Chinese are actually signing contracts under a dollar a watt for crystalline solar. That happened just the other day, just yesterday. Word is out, that's an unbelievable, that, that is 30 years a target forgetting inflation even, uh, that's now been achieved. So now the thing with the problem with this chart is what? It's the thing on the right. With all that change, S-curve penetration and success of renewables, the long-term forecast of the U.S. energy supply is what? Status quo, nothing changed. Imperceptible difference. The green at the top is renewables. Okay, it doubles. But in relation to energy growing, not declining with energy efficiency, I don't see a lot of you know, success of energy efficiency in that chart. And this is the official U.S. government chart, by the way. This is the base case. So the base case of the U.S. government, with all this change, is that nothing's going to change. We basically have the same country, a little bit more renewables, but 
I see a lot of coal, nuclear, natural gas, and liquids, that's called oil, and a uh, the, the little wedge there for biofuels breaking in. But we're not, we're not at the scale needed, uh, and I know some people have said in this conference even that the rules today are okay, let's just keep going. Uh, well, yeah, it's good for this week, but uh, going out 20 years, the rules are not okay. And, and city's here to say we're for rule change. Just we need to know what the rules are, but where we're going is not going to get us there. Uh, I want to compliment Europe for the commitment to 100% uh, renewables. Uh, it's that kind of thinking that will get us to 50%. You know, in, in the tough world out there of competition, you've got oil, gas, coal, and nuclear pushing back. I mean, if you don't try for 100, you're not going to get close. So I'm all for that kind of a goal. Uh, for the advocates. I'm an advocate of renewables. I've been in renewables since 1976, believe it or not. I actually did a lot of the original national studies in the U.S. back in the 70s. So I'm a true advocate, but I'm a practical advocate. You know, to make this thing big, we've got to have the rules, we've got to have the capital. We do have the technology now at a dollar a watt. should be nothing stopping us. But compliments to Europe and my friend Arturo Zervos and, and Christine Lins and everybody who did this work to keep us, keep our sights high. China, compliments again. They're moving up the scale, up to 600 gigawatts. When they passed the Renewable Energy Law of China in 2006, the original goals, as you may recall, was 120 megawatts, or 15% of the then projected uh, generation mix. This is 600. The entire, the entire generation capacity in the United States is uh, 1,000. Here's China going to put in 600 just of, just of renewables. And that's not 2050, that's 2020. So I remember giving a speech in 2006 in, in China when they made that commitment for 15% renewables, and I said, with all due respect, you need to get to 15% non-renewables. You need to go to 85% renewables. So back then, I was kind of speaking like you. Uh, and, but they're, they're not moving there, but they're moving much more aggressively than they said, and they need to be applauded for their efforts. Okay, getting towards a wrap up here. Uh, we're coming out with a thought piece, if you will, in about a month. Uh, it's actually being reviewed by my boss this morning. And, um, and it's called Corporate Sustainability Looking Ahead. Looking Ahead. Where's all this going? Where's corporate sustainability going? And one of the things out of one of the key chapters is this list of six things, which is our definition of modern. We're, you know, we've got all these clients. We can't, we're not their boss. Uh, you know, we, we serve their financial needs, but can we give guidance? Can we, can we get into a trusted, trusted advisor dialogue with our clients? In, in, these, in these kinds of things and be a, be a thought leader uh, without trying to be a dictator. And the, the six things that we sort of built this thing around, uh, uh, that modern corporate sustainability looking ahead is going to be built on is aligning corporate governance with corporate sustainability. If your board isn't thinking this, this isn't going to happen. Okay, so it's got to it's come from the board and it's got to be from the C-suite, the CEO suite. Second, greening company operations. This is essential to all. And, and many companies, of course, are doing that. That's, that's sort of underway. Managing sustain sustainability upstream and downstream. There you've got your Walmarts and, and so forth, uh, looking at suppliers and how green they are and, and demanding, demanding better. Also upstream to customers, if you can believe that uh, companies can influence their customers uh, to like green and, and be more green themselves. Fourth, developing new lines of business that are driven by the drivers of sustainability. There you've got eco-imagination at GE. You've got Shell moving in to the sugar business to make, uh, to make biofuels. You've got a lot of movement in companies uh, aggressively. Uh, FPL Group in the United States becoming next era and the number one owner of renewable energy assets in the United States. Uh, there's an aggressive CEO that created a new, on these drivers. Uh, fourth, engaging the broad set of sustainability stakeholders. This is something I think City, uh, I didn't get credit for it, it was 10 years ago. City really engaged the, you, the environmental groups to, to, and businesses to uh, talk about it, not just close the doors and say we're not talking, but instead reverse that and say, okay, let's talk. And today, uh, there's an active dialogue between City and the many stakeholders being customers and suppliers and employees, as well as the institutional investors and, and so forth. And lastly, expanding transparency and the integration of financial and sustainable, sustainability reporting. On this point, hello, the internet is here. <laughs> Anybody in the rural area of India and Africa can look at Citigroup and find out everything about us. So transparency is now 100%. You want something to be 100%? Transparency is now 100%. So if any company thinks it's going to hide on its sustainability record from you and me, uh, those days are over because we have access to this kind of information and it's gonna get better as we go forward. So this, this sixth plank 
is get real. You are transparent. You are transparent. So behave that way. We all live in a glass house now. So that's it. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Angelina Galitova for uh, who you'll be seeing as a session chair, good friend in the United States, who told me about this conference and got me over here. And I really have uh, so many friends around around the world that are working in this space. And for those of you who are, you know, soldiers in the army, getting this thing done. Thank you, and let's work together. <laughs>